And I went to Romans 1 and I was reading it to her. It says they became hard hearted or darkened mm -hmm. after they suppressed the truth. And I remember feeling, you know, that feeling of going cold when you get scared. Yeah. I felt the blood rush out of my face and I thought I might be wrong. What was it that started to then first challenge those beliefs? Well, I had I had never been challenged by anybody. I had only had two instances that I can remember that I felt I needed to bring up some questions. Uh, I don't remember what brought, brought on this conversation, but I remember speaking to my husband late at night once, just asking him, I don't understand how God determined all my sin. Like, why would he determine for me to go against his will? And my husband's answer was something uh, probably, and it satisfied because the conversation ended, that he uses it all for the good and uh, probably something like that. And it satisfied. Mm -hmm. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't push any further. And then when my children were old enough to where we had left the children's Bibles and we were reading the actual Bible, I was reading through the gospel and I think it was Matthew. And as I read the wedding feast parable, I thought to myself in my head, this sounds like everyone's welcome. Like Jesus is inviting everyone and salvation's available to all. And I thought, how am I going to tell my kids about election? And I left it there. I didn't think about it anymore. I didn't even bring it up to my husband. I just kept moving on. So those are the two times by myself that I felt a challenge, a contradiction. My mother has a, a bunch of stories of conversations she brought to us. And it's funny. I don't remember. And I cannot believe that we did not listen and consider the things she was bringing to us. She brought incredible arguments that now I find so strong that we just did not entertain. Um, mm -hmm. So she challenged us, but I just don't remember. It must have not really impacted me very much. And it was when we were very, very young, just starting at this church, the community had captivated us. And so I definitely think we were blind to challenges because this community was everything. And then my friend, Lonnie, who I recently had on my channel, she shared her testimony and story. And um, this was just three and a half years ago. I posted the Seashells Sermon by John Piper on my Facebook. Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. <laughs> That's a tragedy. And I invited dialogue, and she took the opportunity to dialogue with me. And she brought to my attention the fact that he was praising this couple and also ridiculing, crit criticizing this couple, this other couple, even though he believes that they couldn't have done otherwise. A nice retirement, collecting shells. As the last chapter, before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account with what you did. Here it is, Lord, my shell collection. Look, Lord, my shell collection. They were set in stone to do what they did. So how can he criticize this couple and praise this couple? And, you know, I, I dialogued with her. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. I Even in my first voice clip that I've responded to her, in her initial uh, reply to me, I said, I'm Calvinist to the bone. I told her that. <laughs> Like, this is so funny to listen back to. But we dialogued for weeks, and I, I wanted to show this because everyone always asks what approach I took to, to revisiting everything. The first thing I did was go to this systematic theology book. I got this at Together for the Gospel like five years ago with my husband, John MacArthur uh -huh. and Richard Mayhew. 
wrote this one. So I went to this and I immediately started reading all of the reprobation, info, like whatever, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, just to make clear then, what, what you're suggesting then is that even even in your approach, as be, you began to be willing to somewhat look into this, you, it seems like, would you would you say that you were even approaching it with a bit a bit of a bent or a, a pretty large bent toward wanting to wanting to affirm it. You weren't, in other words, you weren't going in like, I don't like these doctrines. I want to find a way to get out of mm -hmm. them. You were going no in way. hoping that you could be reassured that yes, this is true. Uh, I, I just think that's important for people to realize that you didn't go into this with a motive of, I don't want to believe this anymore. Uh, right. I'm sure this was very uncomfortable as, as these sort of, you know, deconstruction from mm -hmm. th things are, that's a triggering word for some, I'm sure, but <laughs> there it is. It's out there. Um, right. And, and so, so would you say that that's accurate that you went in with somewhat of a bias, you know, you're going to the John MacArthur's mm -hmm. to answer your questions. Um, yes. Yeah. At first, at first I had no doubt that I was wrong. No doubt at all. I went to these to I went to systematic theology and to the biblical doctrine one. And I had zero doubt that I could be wrong. And I started sending her pictures and pictures and pictures of the stuff I was reading with highlights and underlines and scripture. And I started sending her videos of John MacArthur, Vody Bakum, Paul Washer, John Piper of the things that I believed and I wanted her to hear so that I could persuade her to see it my way. And she continued with me. Even though I was not challenged, I didn't have any doubt at all. I thought she just didn't get it. I continued. And it wasn't until the, this, the first inkling of doubt for me personally was when I was reading about all the scripture for reprobation, the argument that God has uh, chosen to save some and the rest he has not chosen either because he chose them for damnation or he just didn't choose them. So they were going there anyway. Those two views. I was reading the scriptures that they used to support that the views. And I remember thinking that that's weak. That's like weak scripture to argue for this. Mm -hmm. I just don't see it. Whatever. It wasn't enough to cause doubt or convince me of anything. I just said that is a weak argument. And I was able to acknowledge that. And then when she asked me to point out to her why I kept saying that we're born haters of God. And I went to Romans 1 and I was reading it to her. And I, could, I've, I actually have the recording of me reading it. I could hear myself. My voice changes because <laughs> it says they became hard hearted or darkened mm -hmm. after they suppressed the truth. Yeah, And that was the first moment out of all the weeks of talking back and forth that I thought, oh, and I remember feeling, you know, that feeling of going cold when you get scared. Yeah, I felt yeah. the blood rush out of my face and I thought I might be wrong. And then that's it. There's no way for me to just be like, okay, I might be wrong. It was like deep dive, everything I believed. And I went here first. I did not go. I went to see what they said, where total depravity is in the Bible, where everything down the line, you know, and it did not satisfy. It didn't satisfy. When I read the scriptures in context, I was like, that doesn't say that we're born this way. That doesn't say that God chose to save some before the foundation of the world. That doesn't say Jesus only died for some. I just went down the line and I was not convinced and it was a life altering <laughs> time. Oh, wow, I, I imagine so. And so that that idea, I think, is so significant that that there's nothing in the Bible that indicates people are born blind, hardened, calloused, and and suppressors of truth. That's something mm -hmm. that develops over time. Mm -hmm. And you know, as Leighton Flowers will point out, uh, that to the idea that either God or Satan will, you know, because there are verses that talk about them blinding mm -hmm. unbelievers or, or, or hardening the hearts. It, it, you know, Calvinists will emphasize, you know, passionately this idea that we are dead, dead mm -hmm. in sin. Dead means dead, totally unable. 
So you have God and Satan blindfolding or sticking earplugs or, or, or hardening the hearts of dead, lifeless corpses, which mm -hmm. is illogical. <laughs> yeah. And redundant to the maximum level, I would say. You cannot get any more redundant than trying to blind a dead person. And so I just think those those are the sort of things that sounds like that that um, um, a lot of people just, you don't, for whatever reason, it just doesn't register. But for mm -hmm. you in this time, um, it began to. And so you talked about in, in your video doing kind of a, a deep dive for like four days or something studying this. And, and mm -hmm. one thing that people I've heard somebody in, in seeing somebody in comments and uh, uh, I, uh, he who will not be named in this video referring referring to you as a whimsical girl or others saying oh. you're just being <laughs> you're being led by emotion. Um, and I just want to say that listening, if you would actually just stop and listen to Alana's story, listen to what she says, um, that is just not the case at all. You were this whole time were, were, were not, again, not wanting to discover Calvinism to be false, mm -hmm. but wanting to prove it. And you were looking to the scriptures. So talk, talk about that, that four day deep dive, just so people know that mm -hmm. this is not something that conclusions you reached because of emotion. Yes, I had no reason to question Calvinism at all. I was comfortable with it, accepted it, believed it was right, it was true, no reason. And even when my friend challenged me, I was immovable until I had reason to doubt through the word. And I did do a four day deep dive, but, and it's funny, people criticize that because they, they're saying that I claimed I came out of Calvinism in four days. No, I, it, that was the beginning of the journey. I, it was Thanksgiving weekend. My mom and husband were home. So I left them with the children and hid in my room. I don't have time. <laughs> I have children that I mm -hmm. take care of full time. So that, that Thanksgiving weekend, I took advantage of other adults in the house. And I was in mostly in this and the scriptures, uh, a little bit of systematic theology, but there was so much overlap. I just, I just focused on the John MacArthur one and pretty much I just read every single passage um, for every single letter in the acronym and every mm -hmm. single passage about uh, the order of salvation, faith being a work, and um, sovereignty of God. And I was not satisfied. So that was just the beginning of what does this mean? I don't fall in line with this, but now what? What about all this other scripture that I do read Calvinistically? And that was a whole other journey. And, and, and the journey is still going. I still run into scripture that I think, mm -hmm. how did I miss this? This is so clear that people can resist the Holy Spirit or that God ha has emotion because he says he does and God changes his mind because he says he does. And these things mm -hmm. that I just didn't take at their word before.